So welcome everyone to our ninth talk. Um, so Lee today will tell us, uh, well, how the survey calculus actually works for an arbitrary coxeter system, so arbitrary many colors. So you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, so today I'm gonna to present the survey calculus for an arbitrary coxeter system. And uh, so first of all, let's have a recap of all the necessary ingredients we need today. Uh, So the first is the geometric realization. So we start with the Coxeter system, W and S. S is the finite jumping set, and W is a group, which we assume throughout the talk to be finite. And uh, for representation, you need a vector space, and this vector space is spanned by all S. Uh, we denote them differently using alpha S, and uh, this forms the basis of our vector space. And uh, this vector space comes with a symmetric bilinear form uh, owing to the, the matrix that comes with the Coxeter system. So we define the pairing of alpha S and alpha T to be minus cosine pi over M S T. And uh, it is a theorem that this bilinear form is positive definite if and only if W is finite. And uh, it's a representation, so we want W to act on the vector space using, uh, act on the vector space as linear operators. And this given by reflection. And uh, it's uh, not so hard to prove, but kind of tricky theorem that this representation is faithful. So now comes the important part. We want to escalate this vector space to a ring. That means we want to introduce product. So to do that, we need to first escalate it to the symmetric algebra, which you all know what it is, is to tensor everything together and uh, quotient all the swappings. And the, the product structure is defined by concatenation. For example, if you have one uh, expression and another expression, you just put a tensor between them and that becomes a new expression. So this new vector space is infinite dimensional. And uh, our Coxer group acts on this ring by acting on each of the entries. And uh, this ring comes with a sub ring. Uh, for every S, it comes with a sub ring. It uh, consists of all the elements that's invariant under the action of S. So for example, all the scalars, that means there's no V, no copies of V, all scalars are invariant under this. And uh, if your S is, if your S is something that, uh, okay, forget about it. Anyway, you have a ring and a sub ring, which is the invariance under the action of S. And here comes the foundational theorem for the whole or center that this RS is a polynomial ring and R O is an RS module which is free and the finite rank and it has breathing. This R can be split into RS and the grading shift of RS. And this is done by using the Demasur operator. So we, it's kind of like a projection. So from R to the second component of R. And just like how you decompose a function into an even function and an odd function, first you, uh, first you act on it and then you do the sum and you do the difference and then you take the average. And this is the precise formula for the splitting. And uh, with this prepared, we can now introduce the both Simonson bimodules. So BS is defined to be R tensor, a grading shift of R. And as we said before, R is an RS module, so it makes sense to set the base ring to be RS. And for general both Simonson bimodules, we just pick an expression 
and uh, write it as a tensor product of all the BSIs. But here, there's something worth noticing that BSW is not defined in terms of W. It's defined in terms of the expression of W. For example, if your W is identity, then we can write W as identity, or we can write it as S times S, because you know, for cocktail systems, every element has, uh, every S has order two. But BS times BS is not the same as R, usually. And that's why we have to define it using expressions instead of W itself. And uh, as before, these BSWs are graded free left or right arm or use of finite ranks because you can see that by first decomposing a single BS and uh, little by little using the distributivity. And uh, with the both Samson bimodules, we can form a category. The category has objects, of course, the both Samson bimodules. And the uh, morphisms are just the graded uh, R bimodule morphisms between one both Samson bimodule and another. And uh, you create the grading difference by first shifting the target and then consider the homogeneous. Uh, morphism of degree zero, and this way you get morphisms of every degree. Okay, but our ultimate goal is to study Zorgel bimodules because it is a categorification of the Hecke algebra. Uh, Zorgel bimodules are defined to be direct sums of finite direct sums of both Simonson bimodules. So, for example, if you have R2, as a vector space and you have the x axis and the y axis you sum them together you get r2 but the direct cement doesn't need to be x or y it can be a tilted line for example so this way we see that zorgo bimodules are more than both samson bimodules and uh, uh, the category has morphisms uh, similar as before we just uh, do the restriction and inclusion stuff and this is the goal of the center, so it's worth mentioning it here. We have the Hecke algebra from a coxeter system, and we have the Zorgel bimodules constructed as mentioned before. And then we decategorify it using the Grotendieck group, and then we are supposed to get a, get back each, which means each should be isomorphic to the Grotendieck group of the Zorgel bimodules. This will be uh, mentioned in the last talk. So here I'm just uh, motivating you guys. Uh, that's why it's important to uh, study the category S by. But the thing is, because it's defined as direct domain, it's very hard to describe what the objects are, and of course even hard to describe the morphisms, uh, both algebraically and diagrammatically. Because diagrammatically, it's not a priori clear how you should draw the uh, direct sum of something. But on the other hand, there's the good news that if we can study BS bind diagrammatically, then we have all the information for S bind. Because S bind is, can be constructed from BS bind explicitly. And this procedure is called taking the Kurubi envelope. And what is a Kurubi envelope? So first you start with a category C. Uh, in our case, C is the BS bind. Uh, you look at every object and uh, all the edambitants on this object. So in particular, identity morphisms are edambitants. And that means our Kurubi envelope contains all the identities, which means our C embeds into car C. But of course, not every edemptant is an identity. So our class C contains more elements. And uh, what is an edemptant? It's equivalent to a projection. And if you guys have some background in, for example, projection modules, you know that it has a bunch of equivalent definitions. And one of them is the, about splitting. And another has something to do with lifting. And this is exactly what's going on here. A projection is equivalently a splitting. <laughs> so we can realize direct summands as projections. 
so we have morphisms, the edemptance, and oh, I'm sorry, we have objects, the edemptance, and morphisms, of course, also coming from C. That is a restriction or inclusion of the <laughs> direct semantics, and uh, in the level of morphisms, it should uh, preserve the projection and the inclusion. And that's why we ask uh, phi composed with f to be the same as phi, which is the same as g composed with phi. And uh, the good news is it's possible to check whether a morphism is an exemption diagrammatically. For example, here we have a morphism. And we can just compose it with itself. And now, because of the relation, we can just uh, erase this part. And we get back the morphism itself. So this is an identity. So I think up to now, we should have reached the consensus that this uh, motivates us to present B as fine diagrammatically. And that will be the rest of this talk. So before doing that, we still need some more ingredients. Uh, the first is the temporary leaf category, which is introduced like a couple of lectures ago. Uh, objects are just uh, natural numbers, or you can say objects are finite sets of thoughts, and morphisms are just crossing these matches between two sets of thoughts. For example, here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dots, and target has four dots. Uh, of course, there are no multivalent dots, uh, multivalent or univalent vertices because you cannot match nothing with something and you cannot match multiple things with multiple things. It's only one to one. But you may oppose because now we have circles in the diagram and the circles match nothing to nothing and that's not match one thing to one thing. But this is not a problem because you can just, in your definition, eliminate all the circles. And uh, in case, if your composition creates a circle, then you can eliminate the circle by imposing a relation like this. So it's not a big deal whether or not to include your circles in the definition. And isotopy is just like what we did before. We have uh, this equal to this equal to that, and so on. So with this relation, you can have any arbitrary equal to a straight line. And uh, with this category, we have something called a temporary leap algebra. So we now consider the endomorphisms, which means the morphisms from n dots to n dots. And uh, this, just like the case of, for example, the endomorphism of a vector space, this forms a ring, and the multiplication is given by a composition. And this ring is actually an algebra over the ring Z delta. Delta is a formal variable, and sometimes we take it to be minus two, so it becomes the ordinary temporary leap category. And uh, in order to proceed uh, to define something called a drawn Spencer projector, we need something more. We need to escalate it to a two category. So now we have objects, just colored line segments. So we want to study the two TL delta. So we only concern with two colors, blue and red. And morphisms are just uh, dots between blue and red and red and blue. So this, uh, the morphisms are generated by, for example, blue dot red and red dot blue. And of course, you can uh, form the whole set by composition. For example, this is three morphisms composed together, which is a morphism. And the morphisms, twin morphisms, are two morphisms. Uh, a two morphism is a linear combination of crossing list matchings, and this time, this time, you color the regions with alternative colors. <laughs> like in the picture below. So you have the blue, red, blue, red as one morphism, and the red, blue, red as a target morphism. And the, the two morphism is K 
can be something like this. And the, this may ring a bell to the last slide because before we define the temporary leap, one category as something with objects like morphisms and morphisms like two morphisms. So this way we can embed the temporary leap one category into the temporary leap two category by, of course, relation. By escalating the objects to one morphism and one morphism to two morphisms. This will be useful later. And now there's a functor from a temporary leap two category to be as fine. But this time we need to specify the delta to be a de Masur operator on alpha t. And uh, if you use the formula, you can compute that this is equal to twice of mst. And uh, how does it work? It maps uh, one morphism to uh, obviously the tensor products of the modules represented by the colors. And uh, it maps the two morphisms to the deformation retract. So for example, here, um, you first retract this region to a single line. Uh, something's wrong. And uh, the other reason, uh, region is the same. And uh, there are open ends and closed ends. The closed ends is because it's the intersection with another region. And the open end is because it's the top or the bottom. There's something worth mentioning here because sometimes it seems that the information retract doesn't give you an unequivalent answer. For example, if you have something like this, So there are two possibilities. One is this. And another is this. But fortunately, we have the Frobenius relation which uh, equates these two. And uh, it's not completely trivial that uh, the deformation retract is always unequivalent, but nevertheless, it's true. So this functor is well defined. And uh, the lifting will be some something in the next talk. But now I just want to say that if you lift sigma to the Karubi envelope, then it becomes a fully faithful functor onto the degree zero maps. But this is not good enough. We want to present BS by um, diagrammatically, and now we have something diagrammatical. But this functor is not a categorical equivalence. So we need to seek further. And the last ingredient we need is the, it's called the jones wenzel projectors. So recall that we have the, temporary algebra, but this time we need to enlarge the coefficient ring into the to the fraction field of z delta, because you'll see later that we want delta to appear in the denominator. So there's a theorem that we have a distinguished element inside this temporary leap algebra so that it is uh, vanished by attaching either a cap on the top or a cup on the bottom. So for information, I read the diagram from the top to bottom. And uh, that's the first condition. The second is that is something about uh, rescaling. The coefficient of the identity must be one. And with these two conditions imposed, we'll find that this JWN exists and is unique. And you get one more condition for free, which is this JWN is an idempotent. So for uniqueness, it's a two-line proof, basically. And the existence 
can be established using a recursive formula because it's very hard to write down an explicit formula. So we use a recursive one instead. And uh, let me remind you that the quantum number is defined as in the box. And although it doesn't look like it is a polynomial of delta, you just expand the denominator to the numerators using the geometric series, and then you uh, change the variables and you get a polynomial. And uh, we can compute the, a few, which are simple. So the first one is in the endomorphism of the set of one dot. And of course, the cap and cup conditions are just vacuous. And uh, GWN has to be identity. It can't be anything else. And for GW2, we can apply the recursive formula before and you get something like this. And because of this one over delta, you now you know that we need to enlarge the coefficients to the fraction view. And uh, we want to apply the functor to it so that it becomes some morphism in the category BS5. So we first need to escalate everything into the two category. The way we do this is to color the regions. So for example, JW1, we have two regions. We color them as blue and red or red and blue. And for JW2, we color it as red, blue, red, and uh, red, blue, blue. So it's like in the picture. And then we can apply the functor, which is we deformation retract the picture. We get uh, three lines and uh, something like this. And if you can write down the formula for JWN, then you can do the same. Basically, first you color the regions, and then you deformation retract, and you get a morphism in BS5. So now the question, what is JWST? That would be the thing applied to JW1. So uh, for example, blue on the left and red on the right. And uh, then deformation retract, we get a blue line and the red line, which is the identity uh, from BTBS to BTBS. And this will be useful in the next slide. And uh, this is the content of our last talk. We have a Sorgo, sorry, we have a cocktail system given by two colors and no relations. And in this circumstance, circumstance, we construct our diagrammatic category HBS to be objects, the words, and the morphisms the same as one color calculus, and there's no interaction between the two colors whatsoever. So if you, color, if you cover blue, you get the diagram red, which is exactly a one color calculus, and vice versa. And uh, under this circumstance, we can actually obtain that this functor, which, send, which is a gluing of the two one color diagram is well defined and gives you a fully faithful functor, which is also a categorical equivalent. But if things get more complicated, for example, if our relation is not infinity, it's some finite number m, then we need an additional morphism called, uh, uh, we can call it a cluster, for example. So if m is equal to three, then we have a blue line, a red line, and a blue line. If m is equal to four, then we get a blue line, a red line, a blue line, and a red line. And what about the relations? The first relation is called the cyclic relation, which is basically an isotopy. Because this cluster is something not topological. It's not as what we've seen before. For example, we have a univalent vertex, we can just treat it as, for example, uh, a one-ended tube. So we have this relation, which is very natural.
because you can just shrink this bud back to the tube. And this is topological, but here we have some things intersecting together, which you cannot find the topological interpretation. And that's why we need to define the isotopies separately and explicitly. And the second is called the jones lenzo relation. <laughs> so it means if one end is closed, then you can move this end to the left and then continue everything. And uh, because of this, we formulated the jones wenzel projectors before. And the third is especially useful when you want to separate this one cluster into two. For example, here is a, here we have, here is an eight million vertex and we now can separate into two six million vertices. And this will be useful in proving an equivalent relation of this one called Elias Jones-Wenz relation. Okay, again, what about M equal to two? And this is why we mentioned the, the JWST in the last page. So M equal to two uh, corresponds to one uh, close-ended red line and one open-ended blue line. And the JWST is just identity. So this relation basis, basically saying that you can just move this dot outside, which means this. You have a red here and a blue here is the same as red and blue. Okay, so now we can really kickstart our uh, topic today. We're gonna study an arbitrary coxer system. So we want to construct a fibromatic category that is equivalent to a BS bind. So the objects are still the words and morphisms are still the same as before. We have univalent vertices, we have trivalent vertices, we have uh, multivalent vertices, and we have boxes. And uh, all the two color relations continue to hold and we have something else called the three color relations because now we have possibly more than two colors. So before I present the three color relations, let me remind you of the classification of the coxeter systems. It's like this. So we want to, we, from the categorification theorem, we can learn that the three colors corresponds to the rank three parabolic subgroups. And what are the rank three subgroups of a coxeter system? Only these four possibilities, A3, a1 times I2, uh, M and B3 and A H3. So here are the four relations. The first is A3, uh, which can be pretty intricate at the first sight, but if you cover everything except red, you get nothing but poor cool associativity. And uh, the same for blue, which is just everything upside down. Oh, sorry, for green. And now the blue, if you cut the graph into halves and apply the Frobenius relation, you get from the left to the right. And this is how you memorize the first graph. And the second graph about A1 times I2M is basically saying that you can move a curve across a cluster. And uh, it's a fun fact that if you add a dot to one end, then this is redundant because it follows from the previous relations. And the dot doesn't need to be here even, it can be even here. And the third one is for B3, which you can do the same as before, you can cover all other colors except one color and you can see some familiar patterns occurring. And the last one is a funny one because it doesn't tell you what the relation is. Actually, the book didn't bother itself to present the relation because I checked from the paper that it is computationally impossible to write down, to even write down the relation. 
So they wrote something like this, which is deeply unsatisfactory, but for the moment, there's nothing we can do. But nevertheless, we won't need this relation in today's talk. And uh, because of this multivalent vertex, I think it's better that we write out the isotopies explicitly. And in the book, it's also done the same way because it presented two, uh, two presentations. The first is called the isotopy presentation, which is as before, two color relations and three color relations. And the second one is just called the presentation, which writes out the isotopies explicitly. So these are what we've seen before. And also this, you can twist a close-ended curve into a straight line. And also, you can do anything that's allowed by topology. And uh, I included this picture in the isotopy page because it's essentially isotopy, just not in the traditional topological sense. Because that means if you have red on the left and blue on the right, then you can bend it downward and bend the blue upward. So get blue on the left and red on the left on the bottom. And now let's do an example to play with these relations. So we have this diagram here. And the first step I'm gonna do is of course to disentangle this part because as I showed you before, for this uh, four valent vertices, you can just freely disentangle. So first you shrink this one to here and shrink this one to here. And uh, because of this, I think this dot shouldn't be here. You get a straight line. And uh, you can move this one freely around because the ends are closed. You're not crossing any walls. And now you are left with these six weighted vertices. And that's the next thing we are going to simplify. So of course, we are going to apply the Jones Benzel project, Jones Benzel projector, and uh, get something like this. And uh, write out this Jones Benzel explicitly. We get something like this. And uh, remind you that partial T alpha S is the same as twice of MST. And then because you have two close ends, you can just cross out this part and this, likewise this part. And you get the dot here. And uh, you can also erase the dot, which means you get this. And this. The last thing we need to do is, of course, to let the barbell cross the wall. And that we do it at a price. So the price here is we need to add an additional term into the box. And if you move it across the wall, you'll get two terms. And if you evaluate u acting on alpha u, you get minus alpha u because u acts on alpha u by reflection. And uh, if you uh, if you <laughs> evaluate the partial u of alpha u, you get two, which is basically because it's a realization of the splitting, and you can check it explicitly using the formula. And then, uh, likewise for the second half, and this is basically how we simplify this diagram. And now let's have more examples. The first is to simplify a six valent vertex with all six ends closed. And it's nothing different from what we did before. We first converted to the drone benzo projector and then we write out the projector as this and that. Uh, there is a there is a coefficient. And you get something like that, which is simple and neat. 
And uh, here comes this Elias Jones Wenzel relation. And according to the book, they say that this is equivalent to the relation we had before. This one. The difference is that here we have a dog and here we don't have a dog. And here we have only one cluster and here we have two clusters. And uh, I am not able to prove this equivalence. The difficulty appears to be how could you remove the dog on the left? And I have no idea, except if you can get down to the bottom by decomposing this drone vental, but I don't think that's the intention of the author. But nevertheless, if we just assume this equivalence, then we can derive another crossing from here. So now we have one blue line and one red line crossing each other twice. And uh, you can do this using the Elias Jones vental by setting this cluster number to equal to four, and uh, you get this diagram. And uh, as I said before, this JWST is just the identity, so you get identity, which means you can do this right master two moves freely. Okay, now let's play with this recursive formula and compute JW3. So first we have JW3 equal to this according to the formula, and now we write out JW2. Uh, which, let me remind you, is first the identity and then minus one over delta and uh, a cup, a cap, and this. And if you do this to the same, uh, do the same to the other G that two, then you expand everything, you get five terms. The first term is like that and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, there should be six terms because there are two terms that merge together. And uh, the next thing to do is, of course, to apply the function sigma to it and get JWTSTS. And to do that, first we color the regions. And uh, then we do the deformation retraction. And this will be JWTSTS, which according to the Elias Jones Benson will be equal to this unshaped diagram. And uh, here comes our theorem of the whole seminar, which is the equivalence between the category, uh, between the diagrammatical HBS and uh, the algebraic BS bind. So we have a functor that goes from HBS to BS bind that sends objects to the obvious counterparts. And because of the modernity, we know what to send the, the tensor products to. For example, if you have an ST, you just send it to BSBT. And uh, for morphisms, here is the list. For a box, you just do it by scalar modification. And for a, a dot at the bottom, you just do it by modification. And uh, for a dot on the top, you do it by something like a co-modification. And uh, for this Y shape, you merge the three components into two using the Demos operator. And for the Y shape upside down, you add a one in the middle. And uh, the funniest one is the last one, because you see, it doesn't tell you what it maps to because it's, again, very boring and uh, unenlightening to write out the precise formula. However, the book did mention something that helps you determine the formula. So the first thing we do is we write down the longest element of the subgroup generated by S and T. So remember that now we have more than two cars, so ST can be just a subgroup. And, uh, it is a proposition that uh, the tensor products BSBT so on and the BTBS so on. 
they both contain BWST as a direct cement up to isomorphism. And uh, this direct cement only appears once. So naturally, you have a projection and an inclusion. And this map is already unique up to scalar. So you rescale it so that it maps tensor products of ones to tensor products of ones. They are not the same because the two modules are different. And as I said before, this depends on the expression. So for example, if you have MST equal to three, then STS is equal to TST, but BSBTBS is not as usually not isomorphic to BT, BSBT. So let's have an example of a concrete map. We have W equal to two colors with MST equal to two. And then we map this uh, four valent vertex to, of course, BSBT goes to BST goes to BTBS. And uh, this time it is an exercise in the book that BSBT is the same as BST. So the first map is identity. And the second map is just from BSBT to BTBS, which actually is an isomorphism. So you get this. Okay, so I'm basically finished with the talk. And uh, originally I planned to give an example of a concrete cocktail system and uh, from which you can write down the quantization, which is the Hecke algebra. And then you can write down the category of the both Samson bimodules of the Coxeter system. And then you take the Kerobi envelope, you get the Sorge bimodules. And then you take the Grotendi group, which they, they categorize this as fine. And hopefully you should get back to H. But uh, first I didn't have enough time. And second, I don't think it's realistic to do that amount of computations. So I just leave it here. If you follow this, these steps, then you should find this isomorphism. And that's basically the statement of the Zorko categorization theorem. And next time, uh, somebody else will tell you why we only have relations up to the three colors. And, uh, the precise statement and the full statement of the Zorko categorification theorem. So that's all of my presentation. Yeah, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, um, are there any questions? So yes, as, as you indeed point out, next time we will, I mean, a priori it's not clear why you don't see any four color relations, right? I mean, why not? Well, the book gave a hint that we can consider the decategorified version, which only has two. So that's why we have three here. That's right, and yeah. Um, but a priori it's not clear why it should be true. Uh, right. It is actually. Um, so yeah. Uh, let me stop the recording.